V from the Gutters, episode 133. Welcome to View from the Gutters, the comic book podcast where each episode we discuss a collected edition, trade paperback, or graphic novel, and then recommend and vote on the book for the next episode. Warning, the discussion portion of this show has massive spoilers for that book. On this episode, we discuss Stagger Lee, and to skip ahead to the recommendation section, skip to 5641. Uh, View from the Gutters, episode 133. I'm Andrew Chard. I'm Tobias Panchin. I'm Kaylee Fleeman. I'm Kenny Wisdom. Hey, Kenny. How's it going? Good, Toby. How are you? I'm doing well. It's a pleasure to have you here in our studio. Oh, thanks. As the podcast coach, I thought I would come on and, you know, kind of get myself in the in in the trenches. Are you going to be like a player coach now? Like back well, in the days, like a a, a, a league I think my uh, I think my playing days are over, but mm. it's good, you know, to really... It's kind of like when... At the beginning of the morning, when Walmart managers they like come down to the, you know, to the clothing floor. department and they like do the high fives or whatever with their team, you know, you got to. Yep, <laughs> you should look it up. <laughs> it's, I, read, I read on Reddit today that it's like one of the reasons Walmart doesn't exist in Germany anymore because they were just like, that's weird. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, no, that's they, they do this I used like to chant. Work there. Yeah. They're not yeah. the only one. A buddy of mine used to live uh, work at Lowe's, and every morning they had to do this like stand in a circle and do this big chant where they sung about how awesome it was to work for Lowe's. Well, that is, tip, it was not isn't awesome. Isn't that strange? You know, it's incredibly weird. That's super weird. It's cult behavior. Yeah. Basically, yeah. if you make somebody act like they're happy, they yeah. become happier. Right. So yeah, if you right. make people act like they wi- like working there, they will like working there a lot more. Right. Yes, <laughs> I inadvertently started to do it and corrected myself. Perfect. I like it. It's yeah. catching on. Uh, quick announcements first. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you, as always, to our episode sponsors, Brandon Hill, Brian May, Addison Appleby, and brand new sponsor, Becca, excuse me, Becca Lewandowski. Welcome. I hope and I Kenny said your name done. correctly, oh. and I will not stutter over it next time. Uh, Kenny, you're not an episode sponsor. Just Kenny my, is a... But you can be an episode host there you go. tonight. Also a sponsor. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I also wanted to go over something real quick because there have been some confusions. We got some messages uh, from people who were not aware of our Patreon stuff, mysteriously, despite the fact that we mention it all the time. Uh, so I just wanted to mention briefly. Oh, passive aggressive. Yeah. Geez. Yeah. Sorry. It's been a long day. Um, <laughs> we just Take revised. Take it out on the fans. That's yeah. What I like yeah. <laughs> uh, I wanted to mention that we had revised some of our Patreon reward levels. Uh, so for anybody who's interested, uh, anybody who donates to our Patreon at any level gets a happy birthday on the air. Just tell us when it is and we'll tell you, say happy birthday to you. It doesn't even have to be your real birthday. You can lie to us like Kenny does. Um, Every week. <laughs> if you donate $3 to us, we'll send you some View from the Gutter stickers. Uh, $5, you'll actually be able to listen to a unedited recording of the episode from our live stream. Uh, and then for $10, there it, you can actually listen to the live stream and comment to us live as we record. Uh, and we have some higher levels as well. $200, you get a fanfic written for you by yours truly. Yes, I actually added that because yes. Kaylee was mad at me if I didn't. Um, Is that $200 per episode or per month? That's per, per month. month. That's, that's kind of that's a not lot. that bad. But it's you only can, fifty dollars per episode. Well, you can donate two hundred dollars once and then bump it down if mm-hmm. you're actually crazy enough to do that. Um, so if you're but interested, if you keep it going. I'll keep writing. Yeah. Uh, if you're <laughs> interested in that or any of our reward levels, check us out patreoncom slash from the gutters, uh, and we'd really appreciate your sponsorship. So, thanks everybody, and now let's talk about the reason that we're really here. Well, first though. I want to introduce our guest. Oh yeah, uh, to those of the internet who may not know Kenny Wisdom. Uh, so Kenny's Kenny's YouTube famous and a true. That's accurate, and also a uh, card game article writing mastermind. Some also would say. true. Some would say. That, oh, you know, mastermind genius, yeah. god king, whatever. Right. Yeah. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> all of want. whatever. Well, I've heard all of those before <clears throat> from people that weren't you. Right. It's yes. super real. Um, mm-hmm. But no, you've been writing articles about Pokemon trading card game yep. for six uh, prizes. Five for years five now. Years? Yeah. About yeah. And uh, you have a YouTube show yep. called on, on the Bubble. on the bubble, and uh, you do Twitch streams of events and stuff. And yep. Just uh. 
Yeah. Big, big Pokemon TCG guy. Cool. Uh, known Shard for a long time. So me and Shard met, actually. Yeah. Back when he worked at the comic store in town. He yeah. used to play Pokemon a bit. Yeah. Um, he decided one day at 2 a.m. that he would come to regionals. That's a different even though story. Regionals, I, know, I, know, I know, but I'm just like, <laughs> even though regionals was like three hours away. Uh, so then he came. That happened the second time that's I how went we to got regionals. Close. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. the first time I went, I, I rode down with you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then we lived together for a while. Um, <laughs> that so. was when Kenny had a beard. Kenny did have a beard. Though. I miss that beard. Also, the beard doesn't really fit with the brand anymore. So, right. if you could, all public acknowledgement of the beard should be ceased. We're gonna have to <laughs> stop this recording and go back. Uh, but yeah, Kenny and I lived together when we recorded episodes like seven through probably like forty or thirty-eight, somewhere in there. No, uh, it was probably closer to fifty. No, we recorded fifty here, right? But we recorded at the uh, but the only, sound house only for, for a while. three months, though. Yeah. Uh, so that I was guess. like that so was probably closer like the to episode like thirty five. Yeah. Okay. So like thirty five episodes. Yeah. Somewhere in there, uh, Kenny and I lived together, and yeah, it's just all just go back and listen to those episodes and recognize that that entire time Kenny was lurking on the other side mm-hmm. of the wall. Mm-hmm. Sometimes listening. I would just sit in the garage and pretend I was on the show, but <laughs> that's tried not to always true. mute my mic. <laughs> That never happened. Uh, but last week you were at Worlds. Yeah, I was in Boston for Pokemon the World Championship World. of yeah. Pokemon. Um, yeah. My best friend ended up winning, or one of my best friends ended up winning yeah. the event, which is pretty cool. Yeah. It was a good time. We didn't all get killed. If you guys That's have heard good. that, uh, the shooters were arrested. So Yay. I'm not dead they, somewhere th- in a convention center in Boston. Can they really be classified as shooters if they did not, in fact, shoot anything? Attempted shooters? Yeah. The, yeah. the gun havers? Implied I, shooters? We remember, yeah, like, I, I was reading all the different, like, stories about, about it, and, like, most of them were just, like, you know, Pokemon, like, tournament stopped or something, but the big, like, I remember, like, Fox News or, like, ABC News published, like, Boston police thwart potential massacre at Pokemon event. And so that was like the thing all weekend was like a potential massacre. Like, yeah. <clears throat> I, I really should not laugh at that. That's not, well, the weird I, thing, I mean, that is a serious thing. Uh, if you're not yeah. aware of this, or if you're listening to this years after the fact, uh, there were a few people who were arrested for firearms violations for having a trunk full Bull, of guns. Yeah. Basically these two people made Facebook posts talking about how they had guns and were going to worlds in Boston and they came and and they got like stopped immediately at the venue and mm-hmm. told to leave. And at that point, we all just thought it was a joke and like, oh, those guys got banned from Pokemon. Like that's you know that, mm-hmm. that they're stupid or whatever. And then the Boston police got a warrant and found like a bunch of un, like you know semi-automatic or automatic weapons with 250 rounds of yeah, ammunition a couple guns and a bunch of bullets. Yeah, and just like they weren't like licensed or something. And basically, it, it, it changed from oh man, these guys like made a stupid joke and now can never play Pokemon again to like, wow, these guys maybe wanted to kill us and now we'll all be in jail for the rest of their lives. Yeah. So. And they're, yeah, they're pretty young. So that's yeah. pretty stupid, but, um, yeah. <clears throat> something better happened when I was in Boston. Though. Yeah. So, uh, for those of you who are friends with me on Facebook may have seen, it was like last Friday. I don't remember what uh, it was. Thursday, Friday. Yeah. Uh, I was in the studio editing all night. I did like three episodes of out of the fridge and like trying to get ahead on stuff. And, uh, I was really hungry. So I posted that someone should bring me some food, please. And then I got a message from Kenny that's like, Hey, you still in the studio? And I was <laughs> like, yeah, I am. And he's like, all right, don't leave. And I was like, uh, the door's locked. And he's like, don't worry. They have your number. <laughs> I was like, okay. And then the Domino's guy showed up and brought me some food. So thanks Aww, for that cross country Boston, <laughs> which I also realized later, you guys are like three hours ahead of me. Yeah. That was at midnight. <laughs> that was like 1130. <laughs> so you, I, was, I was like, wait, come on. Yeah. I'm always, I'm I guess so. Awake. I was really scared. Like, I wanted to just not tell you, like, stay there or anything. Mm-hmm. But I was really scared that, like, you were going to leave and then, like, dom- you know what I mean? Like, yeah, something yeah, would yeah. go wrong. So I was like, yeah. okay, well, I didn't, I don't want to, like, waste this money in this yeah. do- Domino driver's time. So I should probably mm-hmm. actually just tell him to stay. But I yeah. thought it was pretty funny. Man, now, how late is Domino's open? This really late yeah, now. The, okay, yeah, right? I, I was like, it's I, great. Yeah, I was like, oh, they're not, not going to be open. Like, it's midnight over there. And then mm-hmm. I was like, open till two. And I was like, Okay. All right. All right. Well, I guess Domino's did a good thing for there. once. You can always gift me pizzas at the studio. If you know the address. There you go. You can do that. Um, Patreon funding level. <laughs> Reward level. You can yeah. send shard pizzas. Yeah. I'll always eat a pizza. <laughs> I mean, that's just, that's a fact. True chard facts. Um, however, we are here to talk about uh, some comic books. 
several mostly a comic though, book. just the one though yeah. uh stag lee yeah that uh that you pitched w, so, i did uh yeah you want to let us man talk, talk this, about this one this is a good comic like mm-hmm. i read this comic for the first time like 10 years ago almost uh and i haven't read it since then because i mean it's not the kind of thing that really bears like oh man that was so exciting like i gotta read it again like it's it's a little bit new nu- nuanced, a little bit more so slow paced, but man, this thing is like really gripping. It does a really awesome job of weaving together the sort of historical drama with information about the song and kind of the narrative of its evolution and the different kind of points in history and how it's shown up in all these different places. I mean, it's been a ragtime song uh, a blues song a jazz song a rock and roll song like it's kind of evolved along with this legend and they managed to interweave all these storylines in a really organic way so that it makes a lot of sense and it's a lot of fun to read about so yeah like i i really enjoy this comic yeah i I agree i I thought the uh the storytelling like devices through the song were like probably the best part i mean obviously it would have been totally different if they didn't have that but it was definitely like the most i've never seen a comic really do something like that where it took like different bits and pieces and showed you like how the story evolved Mm -hmm. and how the song evolved along with it yeah totally and yeah like just on a personal level uh i know none of the the rest of you had this experience but i grew up in pennsylvania Mm -hmm. and education there was real bad um and so in school like in history we learned about the civil war uh and then we jumped to world war one which mm-hmm. is like a 50 year gap and mm-hmm. i know like not that much about the late 19th and early 20th century uh especially anything that was happening outside of kind of like that that big white western male <laughs> narrative of like you know you know, great men of history and taming the West and, mm-hmm. you know, oh, Spanish-American war, like mm-hmm. whatever. Like learning about the Reconstruction South was not something that I did until much, much later. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it was really interesting for me to see this particular perspective of like what life was like in the late 19th century mm-hmm. for black people in, well, I guess, Missouri for the most yeah. part. Yeah, it's as someone who doesn't really deal with the black experience on a day-to-day basis, it's also just interesting to see that throughout history. Like I'm always really fascinated by biopics about, you know, prominent African American speakers or, you know, any, anything like that. Like 12 years a slave is fascinating. All that stuff is just, it's a life that I will never live or never have any experience with. Uh, And so it's, it's like watching, foreign films to me where it's like, wow, that's such a different lifestyle and different life. And then you realize like, Oh no, that's like, those are Americans. That's also like, like, you could be alive during that time in the same general area, but like have a completely different experience. That's the American lifestyle. That is a a extremely valid American uh, experience. And so it's just, you forget how big America is. And even though we've only been around for 200 and something years, um, it seems like a lot of time. For, yeah. on a personal level maybe not on like a geological or a, a country level but as a human 200 years is kind of a long time so it's just kind of cool to see the evolution of a a country in all of its different phases and whenever you look back on something it's really easy to compress time mm-hmm. like to be like oh this all happened like really quickly yeah and you know um the distance between the civil war and like the civil rights movement in, in your mind is easily compressed into like, Oh, that was like basically, you know, one happened. And then not that long after another one happened, even though there were considerable years and considerable people who lived through, uh, poor circumstances and, uh, you know, a lot of stuff we don't focus on, like what Toby was saying. With it's that. almost like you just think it's not real life in like well, a way, right? Because it just like, yeah. it's just like, it's history. It's like these bullet points in your mind. They're like this right. and this and this, right? Whereas like, there's actually just like, you know, decades and generations of people. Yeah. That have and been I think it's, that. I think it's a big deal to remember why we don't learn that kind of stuff. Yeah. Like this revisionist history of the United States means that we place significant importance on certain events but not on the lifestyle of certain American people. And I mean, that's, 
really the definition of American revisionist history is like, why, why is this stuff so, why, why is the civil war so important? And then world war one, so important and nothing in between important. Why? Yeah. And why I, indeed. And I think those asking those kind of questions is important. And I think reading works like this, uh, are, in, they add a certain amount of insight into stuff that we maybe didn't think about before. Yeah. I think something like this is accessible to mm-hmm. people in a way that, a history textbook isn't yeah. necessarily. Oh, and I think that this is the great kind of thing to like have in a library mm-hmm. where like kids can pick it up and read it and like really learn something that they're not necessarily going to get from their parents or from their mm-hmm. school teachers. Yeah. Absolutely. I think any biographical or historical comic can add a lot of insight into how people um, are portrayed at the time and how they felt, you know, how authors feel about how these characters may or may not have felt based on their research. Yeah. I'm um, a really big fan of, um, uh, what is the name of that book? Uh, Capote in Kansas, uh, about Truman Capote doing the research for In Cold Blood. Yeah. And, uh, I think those kind of books, uh, it's Andy Park's book who also wrote Union Station, which is another historical comic about um a situation that doesn't get written about very often i think those kind of comics make those situations real in a way that a history book doesn't really Mm -hmm. because it's i mean text is just such a different experience than the visual medium of comics yeah i I absolutely agree this kind of stuff and I know you guys make fun of me all the time for it, but this is why I love stuff like Project X Challengers, like business Dude, comics and historical comics. I read Business X Challengers 7-Eleven. Awesome. I am 100% right there with you. That yeah, comic was amazing. It's fantastic. And I, I think that there's a way to tell historical events and events that don't really fit into textbooks. Yeah. yeah. Especially something like this where – you can't really write a textbook about this because the sources are so varied and so unreliable and it is as much about music as it is about a historical event. I mean, that's why ethnography is its own discipline separate from history Mm -hmm. or even biography. Yeah. Uh, And I think that a, a work like this, I think is critical to appreciate at a time like this, when you can look at this and recognize how very little has changed. Mm -hmm. Like you, you look at the things that happen in the book with the way that the white establishment treats the black underclass mm-hmm. and the way that black crime and white crime is treated differently. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can look outside your window and you can see the exact same thing still oh, happening. Yeah. I, I would buy, if the theme in this book was different, I would buy it as like a, you know, set in the present day, like crime drama or yeah. whatever. Like it mm-hmm. just changed a few things, like no, no, like fewer cowboy hats, more like, right. you know, whatever. And it would just be exactly yeah. the same. And I yeah. think that that is part of the kind of the author's point mm-hmm. in writing about how much the song has changed and how often it's been done over the years is that like, it's really been reduced to these kind of core characters that could exist anywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think the comparison between the crime in the book and the like white expansion crime in the wild West mm-hmm. uh, was really striking. And I also think that every time they show, the white faces of the jury and how they look disinterested is really deliberate and intentional. Oh and yeah. So something that you can see mirrored today. Um, well, and they even, uh, they put this like two common iterations of the song side by side. And it's what white artists would tend to sing mm-hmm. and what a black artist would tend to sing. And it was like, we hung him. Mm-hmm. or they hung him mm-hmm. uh things like that and um i swear i had to point um basically it's just kind of kind of the way of like treating this crime as like either a serious offense or something that was like well it was kind of a weird thing but what did you expect which was kind mm. of the white attitude towards that um so yeah. it had a, a bit of a novelty to it because it was like Yep, he was just a bad man, and that's mm-hmm. what happens. And I think it's interesting, too, that while the crime itself was not racially motivated, as far as we know, it's, mm-hmm. you know, um, 
the trial was definitely racially motivated. And I think that it's interesting that they took a character like Nathan Dryden, the lawyer who represents um, Lee. Yeah. Uh, and he was not a black man in history. Right. Yeah, he was a white yeah, guy. If you and read, so if like you read a, at the end of the book, they right. talk about like, well, these are some of the things that we changed for the sake of the story. And this was the one big one. And that was kind of accidental, too. Right. Like at first, there was a reference to him being black. Right. Some sources said he was. And then he found out later, like, oh, actually, that was a that was an error. Yeah, like they found a picture of him. So in that case, I think the story changes even further, where it's like a white judge, white lawyers on both sides, white jury. Like that's, it's just such a strange place to find justice for this crime um and i think that bringing up the point that this kind of man walks into a bar has a disagreement with another man over a hat over possibly a hat um one of them gets shot and how many times have we seen that in a western where like two guys meet in the bar and it's like this town ain't big enough for the (laughs) both but john you know like kicking the doors in wild west with you know john wayne building airports and whatnot and you know one of them gets shot and it's like oh town justice somebody walks out that's end of the story right like he doesn't go to jail he doesn't become this prisoner who dies in jail of tb after the song has become popularized yeah which is another really strange thing when you so weird right and especially when you think about jury's perception and how like in the modern day you'll lock a jury down and they don't get tv they don't get internet they don't get any of that because they don't want media uh, the media to sway them in any way right 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 but this is a, a case in which the main character has become this like folk legend song dies in 1912 the songs were being written down and redistributed by 1910 yeah and like this is a work song mm mm-hmm. mhm he might have very well sung the song about himself yeah. before he died. I yeah. mean, obviously, like he was dying of TB that time, so he might not have been healthy enough to work a right. work crew. But he definitely well. And the like, book theorizes very likely that, could have heard it. Yeah, he heard it in jail. The book theorizes. Uh, so. And I just I wanted to point out uh, since you were mentioning westerns, the book opens with a quote from the man who shot Liberty Valance, mm-hmm. which is an incredibly famous western. Uh, when the legend becomes fact, print the legend. Right. Yeah, I think that this is definitely a response to that kind of like spaghetti Western tradition of the, you know, stand, standoff in the in the desert, tumbleweed yep. rolling through. Is like, totally. These guys had a disagreement that had nothing to do with the law or politics or, you know, the town at, at large. And yet in this case, it seems to have been a big deal, where in the lawless West, quote unquote, uh, it wasn't a big deal. And I wonder how much of the author's intent is to show the difference between that as a difference between white on white crime and black on black crime, or as a difference between the quote unquote civilized East coast versus the uncivilized West coast. That's interesting. And I don't know. And I kind of want to reread it again and think about that because I, it wasn't apparent. And I wonder if you could dig some more of that out of the text. Yeah. I don't know. Um, Something else that I wanted to dig into a little bit since you brought it up was the art mm-hmm. and specifically the way that it was strictly black and white, mm-hmm. or at least in the edition I read, brown and white. Mm-hmm. Um, and the fact that like all the black characters were not drawn with like shaded in faces. Right, yeah. They were drawn with black facial features, mm-hmm. or I, I guess you would say African facial features. Uh, uh, and but hair. everybody, yeah, everybody has white faces. Right. Mm-hmm. Like you really have to look at the people and read their their racial origin from context from the context or, yeah. and, and from their appearance rather mm-hmm. than any kind of color yeah and i think that that coloring is a very specific choice on the part of the creators i do too uh one of whom was white and one is black mm-hmm. um to i i think kind of draw a line specifically and make you kind of think about what you're looking at right and why it matters you know yeah because the characters don't look all that dissimilar, but why are some of them being treated specifically very differently than other people? Yeah, I realized that about maybe an eighth or a quarter of the way through the book. At first, I was like, man, this art's really annoying. Like, everyone looks the same. Like, mm-hmm. I can't even tell the races of characters. And I was like, oh, wait. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I get it. I get it. I'm on board. Yeah. I'm on board. Yeah. Yeah, and I think <clears throat> uh, a, a less talented artist wouldn't have been able to pull that off as well. Yeah. Because once you start to look for 
like who's who and learn what people's faces look like, it's really easy to tell everybody apart. Like yeah. I don't see a lot of same face in this. Like everybody Absolutely. has differently shaped heads and faces and expressions. And it's the art in and of itself in just the facial features is better than a lot of comics I've read. There, there is one thing that they do, which is with, uh, Lee and Billy, because mm-hmm. you see so many different versions of them. Lee is always wearing like really squiggly lined mm-hmm. clothing, like a and, shaded textured. Yeah, and Billy has the the like checkerboard, mm-hmm. like, right? Straight uh, uh, perpendicular lines. Yeah, and through every iteration of them that you see, except when uh, you see not Stagger Lee but Lee Shelton in mm-hmm. jail wearing jail clothes or in court wearing court clothes mm-hmm. like they're always wearing those same colors or patterns, patterns yeah uh even when their appearance changes very radically yeah and, and that I, really helps you keep track of who's who absolutely especially when they're changing size or talking about how like which one was the tall one and which one was the short one it could have been really easy to lose to lose your way in the complicated drawings but they make it really simple with that and i love the texture because I feel like it's probably one of those like cut out shading techniques where they like cut out the shape. Oh, from yeah. From those like te- the way that like yeah, a like lot of anime China. artists. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I kind of wondered about that because I was looking at it. And I was like, man, that had to have been a pain in the butt to draw. I don't remember what that's called, but. Uh, that- Pantone. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, Pantone is just colors, right? It's like you have Pantone colors. Maybe I'm thinking of something else then. Yeah. But yeah, there's definitely a name for that where, where you it's like, like cut yeah. out the shape of what's going to be the pattern and then you can like overlay it. They use it on shadows in manga a lot because it saves a bunch of time. Right. But. Yeah. It's like right. basically pre made cross hatching. Yeah. It's cool. I agree with the both of you. Like, I think uh, at first I wasn't sure I felt about the art, like I said, mm-hmm. especially because I feel like. In, in comics and even other forms of media, I have a hard time telling characters apart. Mm-hmm. For instance, Game of Thrones. Mm-hmm. The first season of Game of Thrones, I they I don't know who can tell those people apart. They're all just like <laughs> white guys with brown hair. It's always like gloomy outside. Sort of a little stubble. Y- yeah, like, I, I just could not tell them apart. And really good That's bodies. what I kind of felt in the beginning of this book because it's the art is kind of, um, I'm not sure the word for it, but I guess like, I don't want to say sloppy because it's not sloppy. I, I mm. like the art, but it's it's not very like, it's got, super detailed. It's, it's gonna, got it's, like a push push and pull to it. Yeah, like it's, it's gonna have a sketchiness. Like, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah I'm not really what the term is. But. So, like, I like the way it changes too because it goes from very defined, like this is the rigid shape of things because we're in the real world, to a more like animatorly style in yeah. when it's talking about the song. <laughs> and you'll see like the exaggerated holes in people's heads and stuff right. that look yeah. like cartoon. Yeah, I would say like cartoony. Yeah, like yeah, it goes back and for forth it. between this kind of like traditional you know thin line pencil work and your animated style well, so, something that's cool too is depending on which version of the song that they're talking about they will draw uh stagger lee and lions yeah billy lions billy mm-hmm. lions differently mm-hmm. and not just like shape wise in ways that's like really obvious but they'll make eyes a little bit more narrow mm-hmm. or teeth a little bit pointier mm-hmm. things like that like traditional cartoony things to make a character look bad or look good. Mm -hmm. Um, And they will do that sort of a thing or they'll add accessories to them. Um, Toby has a page open right now where there's like a noose around. um, It's Stagger Lee's. Stagger Lee's neck and stuff like that. It's just like, it's cool because it pulls a lot of this imagery that you're familiar with as somebody who has watched any cartoon ever yeah. and it relies on that to establish a mood instead of trying to redefine it every time i also like how they'll change time period of their clothing based mm. on what the song they're talking about is when it's from yeah uh i in the background too like they'll just ch- they'll change things about the song yeah. to make it reflect or about the drawings to make it reflect the song they're talking about i also think that that animatorly Exaggerate, exaggerated style, I guess I would call it, um, when they're talking about the song, helps you denote when it is the narrative and when it is, like, the narrator discussing the song. You I know? also have to say, looking at Toby's copy now, the one I read, I read it on my iPad, and mm-hmm. it was just black and white. Yeah. And looking at Toby's brown and white, even from across the room, is, it looks really nice. Like, I think yeah. I think that would have added to the experience for yeah. sure. Like, it's very almost manga-esque, you know what I mean? It's very Western. Yeah. It's very, like... 
it a- adds a lot to the theme, which I think the art in general does. I think yeah. the art's like the perfect match for this kind of book. I think that the brown not only adds kind of the antique look mm-hmm. that people go for, but I think it is a softer right. color. Yeah. Yeah. It also helps that the edition I have, like the the pages aren't like bright white. Yeah. They're they're kind of like a uh, like tannish, kind of like yeah. cream color. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's kind of like brown and cream and like there, despite the fact that it's this like very sharp separation, two distinct colors, they kind of muddy into each other mm-hmm. a little bit. Like the pages like look like manga pages. Like they don't look like a glossy, like yeah. white page, you know? It's yeah. Just yeah. Nice. It's that like newspaper print yeah. that right. uh, you'd see in like a Shonen Jump or something where it's like even, even the white and the black are both not true whites or true blacks. Yeah. They're it also like helps that there's like... The only narration boxes are the narrator and the one narrator talking about this, the music and the history. And when you actually go into the narrative, it's all word balloons. There's no captions except right. for like dates. I do find it really d- uh, distracting though. While they're talking about the song, he'll go back and forth in the narrative boxes still. He'll go back and forth between when it is the song and when he's talking as oh, a narrator yeah. and sometimes that threw me not that that was like a horrible thing but i feel like you could have done a very slight design change yeah to denote when it was the song versus yeah when like the italicizing the letters in the song yeah or something just a, a change in the size of the box or like you know or not the size but the or, style of yeah the box. change the border a little yeah, bit or something. something yeah yeah so absolutely as as far as that goes i really liked the way they broke up a lot of stuff because all of it seems really intentional and really like well thought out and that was one part where i was like ah, this is a slight misstep that I feel like everything else was so deliberate that that stuck out. Where in another yeah. book, where and not everything is deliberate, I wouldn't have noticed it. Yeah, no, I can totally see that. Yeah, uh, I'm curious to know what you guys thought about the actual like narrative, like mm-hmm. the 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 historical story that they were telling. Because not only are you getting the trial of Lee Shelton, mm-hmm. but there's also the, all this other stuff with the Hercules Moffat, mm-hmm. the piano player, and the the woman that he's dating who's mm-hmm. engaged to the law clerk like yeah there's this whole love triangle thing that's happening that's completely separate mm-hmm. and then you're also getting like the political narrative mm-hmm. and the corruption there and the election of this attorney uh, uh prosecuting attorney mm-hmm. uh and so i'm i'm just i'm kind of curious to, to know what you guys thought about that whole thing because i i found that story really compelling in and of itself mm-hmm. yeah I, I found all the side stories especially the uh, Hercules Moffat Moffat yeah. story really interesting. I thought it added like a bit of depth to the book mm-hmm. that otherwise wouldn't be there. Even though the story, the you know, kind of a I guess like headline story would have been rich enough for you know yeah. pages and pages. I think that that added kind of along with what we were talking about earlier, kind of uh, showed the rest of the world. You know what I mean? As it was and how other bits, like especially the political, the political bits really showed that it wasn't just like this wasn't a you know kind of thing it's a thing that existed in the world and there are other real things going on at the time yeah and i think that i think that um hercules and the uh woman that he's seeing who was uh a prostitute and may still be based on she kind of goes the back last and forth, interaction yeah. he has with her so yeah, the law clerk is engaged to marry her. Her previous husband was the funeral parlor owner, um, and he died. And before that, she was a prostitute. And I think that prostitution plays a large role in American history just because it's always been prevalent. But I think that's what o- also makes me able to relate the book to modern day. It's like, this is not an experience that ever went away. And right. that sex workers feeling like second class citizens because of the way they're treated by everybody else still exists. That's Um, not just sex workers, but black sex workers who are Mm -hmm. lower, even I would say than white sex workers in terms of like, when you talk about social class, Mm -hmm. like these women are not serving the upper echelons of society. Like I think that they, they are even lower down. There's definitely a lot of, there's been a lot of writing, especially very recently with the what was the what was that website Rent Boy that was exposed? Oh, Ashley, yeah, Madison. Ashley Madison. No, 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 <laughs> not okay. Ashley Madison. Because okay. Rent, so, Rent Boy has been around for a right, long time. Right. So Ashley Madison is the Christian people cheating on their husband and well, wife. Well, not specifically website. Christian, not specifically but it's it's yeah. it's people's yeah. wanting to get married people. Yeah. 
so Mary Peter. It's basically the same thing. It was outed because a Christian pastor who was all like, the sanctity of American marriage was like, also, I bone other women on the side. Um, you know what's funny about, though? Uh, I was just reading a thing right before we started to record. There's something like 55 million men who are registered on that website mm-hmm. and maybe 10,000 women. Yeah. Like – most of the women on that website are fake accounts that are not real. That are uh, That's funny. In much of the history of the internet, it's men pretending, no, pretending to be, to be women, women. women so that they can talk to other men. Which, right. is, you know, you live your life the way you want to live it, that's fine. But there's definitely been a lot of writing recently about specifically sex workers because that's what the whole rent boy thing was. About. So, yes. what, what, is, what is is that? Uh, it's, similar? It's, it's male, gay male prostitutes. Okay, yeah. okay, 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 right. That's what it sounds like, Kenny Ray. Really? Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, but there's definitely been a lot of writing recently about sex work and about how even when it is like, well, it's my choice. I'm choosing to to be a, a sex worker, which technically is still illegal in America. Um, in most places. And, well, yeah. But it also depends on you know how you define sex work and all of, all of the above. Um There's a lot of writing recently about how economic situation forces you into work that you would not normally take because the legal ramifications of getting caught doing that job are high. And that goes for, you know, drug dealers and also sex workers because they're both doing an illegal trade because they're most of them because their economic situation is not good. A lot of modern writing specifically in regards to like hip hop culture and that kind of stuff involves both of those things where it's like, you know, drug dealing because that's because you had to support your, you have to support your mom and your family. It's like, if you don't make it as a NBA player or a rapper, like that's it, that's your other choice. Right. And that's, that theme is prevalent in rap since uh, probably the seventies. And also that prostitution is, an outlet for women in those communities too. Trying to say that without right. coming off as like insensitive, but in a lot of poor communities, like you turn to things like drug dealing and prostitution because you don't really have a lot of economic outlets. The opportunities provided to people who come from money or come from a higher social class, if, which we have in America, um, have more opportunities and therefore do other jobs. But when you don't have those opportunities, you will turn to, you know, criminal activity to make money. And that's just kind of, it's like what Jay-Z said, you know, we're not doing crimes because we're, we're doing fine. Yep. Right. I mean, Uh, yeah, it's gone. One of the things I want to bring up, especially in, that That, time period. Sorry, I misquoted it. I wanted to, it's, we're not doing crimes for the sake of doing crimes. We're doing crimes because we ain't doing fine. Yep. That's the line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Kaylee. Okay. okay. Um, particularly in that time period, you had a lot of uh, brothels and like homes opening up, basically, mm-hmm. because it was the only way that women could get out of abusive circumstances mm-hmm. and have their own income and mm-hmm. have a way to live well, um, or at least significantly better than they might have if they were like if they just kind of had to marry the first schmuck that came along Mm -hmm. um and so a lot of that discussion kind of gets swept under the rug because people are like oh well you know this they had to do it it was like no choice and it's Mm -hmm. like well no the choice was either i can be miserable or i could do this and Mm -hmm. it's it's a lousy choice but it is a choice in the way that it's like, well, I don't feel like being miserable my entire life. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of those homes provided a lot of protection for women. And mm-hmm. um, I think this comic does a good job of portraying that home in a way where it's the, the women are protected or um, at least as much as they can be. They're provided with the things that they need. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a way out, mm-hmm. which is important. Um so that when they decide, okay, I'm done, you can leave. Hmm. Um, And it was just, I I felt like the portrayal of the home was really important because I think it's easy, especially when you have male writers, to just say, 
Well, these women, these poor, unfortunate women, Mm -hmm. these poor women, they would never do this, but this was the lot that they were dealt. And it it is, it is a conscious decision. Mm -hmm. It is a decision that many women, uh, especially up in Seattle, I don't know if any of you have done like the underground Mm -hmm. tour or anything like that, but wanted to for a long time. It's really cool. There are a lot of brothels and stuff that opened up in Seattle and it was one of the best districts to be in, Mm -hmm. to, to live in as a woman to, uh, it was an incredibly supportive community. It was a very protected community. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was honestly, the best option if you were a woman of like a lower social standing and for some women even if you were of slightly higher social standing it was still a better option and also i think that prostitution and the portrayal of prostitutes has always gone in hand in hand with crime fiction which at the base level this is historical crime fiction absolutely right. like this is a story about of crime and by my definition of crime my definition of crime fiction which is the story couldn't take place without the crime, uh, this book wouldn't really have a basis if it mm-hmm. weren't for the crime of the shooting. Um, some writers really get it. Some like this, this writer obviously has done his research or these writers have done their research. They know about the American experience and they know about that aspect prostitution of the criminal element of American history. Yeah. I mean, and, this is obviously incredibly well researched yeah. if you read mm-hmm. through their notes. Yeah. And I think that it, it has gone through the ages and it, it appears in a lot of detective fiction. It appears in a lot of crime fiction and some writers really get it. Like when Robert B. Parker talks about it, I think he really understands like this is a way out for a lot of people and this isn't a choice for other people. And there are some writers that clearly don't get it and they make it out to be this way to hate women. And I think Frank Miller. Can, people <laughs> like Frank Miller <laughs> who choose to turn women into prostitutes, to turn characters into prostitutes to show that they are, not good people or less than people. Right. I think it's, it's just like, like oh, they've fallen just, on low times. Right. Like she's become a prostitute, like right. lowest of the low. It's just outright misogyny in a lot of ways to just, yeah. it's just, uh, it becomes a stand in word for women I don't like, which is not really right. the definition of it or what it should be used well, it's, for or what it's, it's like about, when you, you, know? you call a woman a whore. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, I, why? Like, why? Why would that be an insult? Like, why well, do you because, assign a, like a loaded yeah um, connotation to this word? Mm-hmm. Well, women should only sleep with the people you want, right? Oh, yeah, that's oh, just yeah. the like, rules. Yeah, just... I've always been so confused as to why sluts are supposed to be bad people. I mean, it's wow. it's somebody who knows what they want and is willing to go because out and get it. Like, good on good yeah. on her. Because men hate women. Did you forget? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, like, it's, like, just, bottom it's so line, ridiculous it to like, me. Straight up, the answer is because men right. hate women. Yeah. That's like that's why. I mean, I'm not saying I don't know the answer. I'm just saying it's mind boggling. No, I tell, I no, agree I with you, and it's stupid. And that's like that is the point is that that kind of misogyny doesn't make any sense, and that. Even though you consider like, okay, well, maybe if in some weird reality you consider that like prostitution or being a whore is the lowest possible level um, of job hierarchy you could have as a woman, then like why is the same negative connotation not uh, allocated to the like a low, uh, low job on the male job hierarchy chain like – garbage man or podcast retail coach. yeah or like retail <laughs> worker like yeah or podcast coach right. like you don't ever hear that as like a slur against men right right and it's not it's because it doesn't make any sense absolutely and in the same way you know that kind of it doesn't make sense towards women either it's just a thing that became a thing because men hate women exactly hashtag, <laughs> hashtag men hate women i mean it's a lot of american history has to do with the fact that men hate women and also that white people don't like anyone that's not like them and i think this book brings up brilliantly both of those points and talks Absolutely. about it in a way yeah. that is palatable to people who may not have read something like this before i think it's important yeah i think this would make an absolutely riveting episode of law and order I mean, crime yeah. and mm-hmm. sex and murder and I feel like po- this, political corruption this is a lot of episodes of law and order SVU. yeah Right. Also, Absolutely. criminal intent. I'm pretty sure that there's only ever been one Law and Order show. 
They just put, you keep putting different words on it. Well, and different actors. It's just it's just the same thing. It's like just the, the same episode over and over yeah. and over again. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Basically, it's still great. Yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> I'm gonna watch all. Yeah, of it. I mean, it, it, it's always on television, and it's always good every moment of the day, in, yeah. no matter where you are in America. Yeah. So, it, I mean, yes. It must be good. <laughs> well, they've been making that show for what, like more than fifteen years at this point. Oh God, I don't even know. It's for a lot. long time. It's got to be more than twenty. Like I'm almost positive it's more than twenty. It's a yeah. lot of seasons <clears throat> for at each one of those. Law and Order, Law and Order SVU, and Criminal Intent both have like ten se- or all of them have like at least ten seasons. It's nutty. Also, CSI and all those yeah. are like very similar. I mean, they're they're shows about crime. I mean, and about the legal system in a way that this is. And anyone that tells me they're looking for, like, a good crime story or a good fans of Law & Order or CSI would absolutely put this book in their hands because I feel like it's the same kind of drive to figure out, oh, well, what really happened? What is this all about? That makes those shows interesting is what also makes this interesting. I think that it is unfortunate that in historical in what actually happened was that uh, Lee died in prison of tuberculosis. I think that's sad. And I think that it doesn't make a very pleasing narrative ending to a fictional story, but that's, it's because it's historical fiction that it's, pa- that it's easy to accept. Like, cause I feel like this would have been well, a letdown had this been entirely fictional and none of these characters were real. It had actually been a narrative that, right. you, were, that you had made up. Yeah, right. and you were right. like, oh, what's going to happen at the end of the case? And it's like, well, actually, his second lawyer just became a drunk. They sort of lost the case, and he died of tuberculosis. You'd be like, oh, well, that wasn't very sad. I mean, well, like, oh, that, but that's the thing for... is that that's not the end of the story. Like, right. That's the end of Lee Shelton's life, right, right, but right. that's not the end of Stagger Lee, which is the title of this book. Because but Stagger Lee goes yeah. on for decades after that. Right. But the way uh, the narrative structure of the book works, like that is the end of the yes, book. And the, although the the song continued on, they talk about the song before you know a lot of the details. Right. And I actually wanted to mention that because Kaylee was bringing up to me when we were getting coffee before the show. Uh, you see Lee Shelton, mm-hmm. like the very beginning of the book, prologue, mm-hmm. him shooting Billy Leans, like no dialogue. Mm-hmm. Then you do not see Lee Shelton for like 60 pages after yeah. that. You see Stagger Lee, and mm-hmm. they talk about Stagger Lee, but you don't see Lee Shelton for a long time. And I think that that's really interesting because they're, they're immediately kind of drawing a line of separation, and you don't mm-hmm. necessarily notice it at first. That mm-hmm. They're talking about Stagger Lee, the character, but Lee Shelton is missing from this narrative for a long time. I think that also plays into the whole were the jury affected by the myth that grew up around this murder before they ever even saw Lee Shelton in the courtroom. Yeah. I I wonder if that was intentional in that way. I also like how they broke up the story in chunks. So you get like some Lee Shelton, some the lawyer, some the political stuff. That was the best part. Some, you know, yeah, some Hercules. And then you jump back to the song and it kind of all starts back over again in a very like episodic manner. Yeah, I liked that a lot. It made reading it... like feel like you weren't spending too much time on any one subject. So you never really got bogged down in the details. I feel like episodes of TV or something like, wa- yeah. or like ch- chapters of an actual book. I yeah, guess. Yeah. Like it, cause it, um, yeah. Um, oh, I was just going to say, it reminded me a little bit of uh, watching the civil war on PBS with my dad. Mm-hmm. Like that kind of episode by episode, like yeah. this happened and mm-hmm. then this happened. And like, here's all of these narratives kind of rolled together because yeah. Something that big isn't just one thing. It's right. many little things put together. Yeah. I think this story does a really good job of juggling all of that and not letting you get bogged down. Yeah. Some historical Totes. fiction, unfortunately, is not really – it's not that fascinating to read. Like it's cool, but it, the narrative storytelling isn't that good. Right. And I think this is a case – this is not the case for this book. I think it is – it's also an interesting read regardless of being historical. Because it, the characters that are fictional that are introduced help move the story along. Yeah, and I really dug it. So, same. Yeah, I wasn't until uh, I don't know, probably ten minutes into reading the book when I uh, had to get up and do something. I was looking at my phone. I wasn't aware that it was historical. Like I had never heard the song, mm-hmm. and then I was just, like googling the book to like yeah. read something and like mm-hmm. stumbled upon it. So like I agree that I could have gone the entire book without knowing that and it still would have been as compelling and yeah as interesting just thinking it was fiction yeah 
Because yeah. and even or the song, fiction. even people who wrote per, or not wrote but performed and covered the song, may have never known that Lee Shelton was an actual guy. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm assuming that a lot of them didn't yeah. know that. And I actually, I, while I was sitting there, I was pulling up YouTube to listen yeah. to all the different versions of the song as they were talking about <laughs> mm-hmm. it. It was really interesting to see the different ones. And then, of course, I pulled up some other ones that they didn't talk about, some of which were just covers of previous versions. Yeah. Like I found an Amy Winehouse version that was a cover of an earlier, mm-hmm. uh, I think, rock rock and roll version from the early 50s. Mm-hmm. Um and just it's amazing to see like how many people have done versions of this song that like yeah. until I'd read the book I'd never really heard it. Yeah. yeah. Are the songs in the book like taken from actual songs that are made yeah. now? Like did you find like matches to each one? Yeah, every yeah. every song is a real song. That's cool. Um, about. Yeah. I think probably one of the most recent ones they talk about is the one by Nick Cave, who's mm-hmm. like still around, still doing yeah. stuff. Well the Grateful Dead one's one of the more famous ones, right? Yeah. Although I mean the Grateful Dead are they they're not really touring anymore. But they kind sometimes. I mean, I know Jerry Garcia has been dead for a long time. Yeah, they do. They do reunion tours. Luckily, he lives on through an ice cream flavor. Like my we all hope my to. second, or well, maybe my favorite ice cream flavor. It's one, it's in my top couple. Yeah, the sure. Jerry Garcia is a fantastic flavor. I was talking about mint chocolate chip. But well, yeah, it's, like, it's <laughs> crazy yeah. just to look through the list of all the different versions. Jerry Lee Lewis, mm-hmm. Tennessee Ernie Ford, uh, Johnny Otis, Tina Turner, mm-hmm. Good old uh, Tina Turner, the Isley Brothers, Fats Domino. Like It just goes on and on and on. Yeah. And interesting, too, that it, it originated in blues, moved to R&B, into rock and roll, into like soul, all predominantly. Neil Diamond. Well, but they're all predominantly music from the black cultural experience. Yeah. You know, like these music created and performed by black artists and performers. Yeah. I think that that's interesting that it kind of has continued to follow that. I I don't know. It's a really, it's a, it's a fascinating book and unlike a lot of comics I read. Yeah, so and I, I mean, and I think that that's part of the reason why it grabbed my attention so mm-hmm. much. And it's not something that I would have ever picked up on my own. So I have to give a shout out to Eric Troutman for yeah. recommending this book to me. Yeah, um, it, it's a real gem and something that I was glad to discover. Yeah, for sure. And who who it, is it? Who is it actually by? I didn't. Is it by it, someone that's like big in the comics world? No, it's by Derek McCulloch notice. and Shepard Hendricks. Um, and it talks about the author in the back of the book he worked in comics in the late 80s and early 90s uh co-founded the comic book legends legal defense fund which Mm -hmm. is the canadian version of the comic book legal defense fund right interesting uh and then the artist started working in comics in the early 90s uh mostly as an anchor for like dc and dark horse and milestone um and then i think he yeah he left comics in the mid 90s and this was like the first thing that he had done coming back like 10 years later. Wow. So both of them had worked in comics before, but they'd been out of the game for a long time. That's cool. Interesting. So, and I'm I'm not sure what they've done since then. I really need to look them up. When was this published? Uh, 2006. Wow. That's very cool. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a great book. And I hope that those of you out there who have read it appreciate it. And I hope that anyone out there who has not read it yet will go and check it out. Please read yeah. this. Absolutely. This is, like Toby, this is something that I would have just never picked up on yeah. my own at all. I hadn't even heard of it. I didn't have any of the creators, but was defied my expectations by a long, mm-hmm. by a long shot. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and let us know what you thought about it Yeah, in the comment section. This like, comment, answer. and subscribe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> talk to us on Facebook or email us. Let us know what you thought. And, uh, twart at us. To, yeah. At, at twarter.com. That's, if you're going to send us on, art, then you can twart at us. Otherwise, <laughs> just tweeter at us. Add me on Is Tinder. twart an actual thing? Twarting, yeah. Really? It's when you send, it's Twitter art. Oh. Twarting. It's oh, you weird. should definitely twart at us. Yeah. Oh, my God. It's a real thing. God, I, why? It's as real as tweetering. <laughs> I want some fan art of you guys. Yeah. We we do have some fan art. Yeah. Um, Ali Joffrey very Ali, kindly Ali sent Joffrey us some hunk. prints of uh some fan art that he drew for us and it's hanging on our studio door Mm -hmm. and also in my house Mm -hmm. nice yeah and uh i feel like we've gotten some other fan art too but 
Yeah, uh, a couple of pieces. Yeah. I know but Kit's, none uh, of Kit us. has drawn some fan art of us. It's not of that's us. Just friend, well, it's that's just me friend and Joe. Art, oh, okay. That's friend art. And also just me. That's friend fiction. And, and my <laughs> alternate persona, Admiral Toblerone Bunnycrackers. Right. Who, the, the bearded wizard who lives down the lane. Right. You have like a hat, like an admiral hat on in there. Yeah. You he, are an admiral wizard. Yes. Is admiral that, wizard. Is that your first sona? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I, that's, I that's, that is my whiz sona. I introduced Mannix to uh, Sonic the Hedgehog personas one time before an episode. I was like, you have to search Eric the Hedgehog. And he was like, why? Why am I doing this? <laughs> and then he was like, oh my God, this is the thing. No, make it stop. I mean, the whole Original out of the fridge. character, do not steal. Yeah, the whole out of the fridge crew, we were all Googling our Sonic the Hedgehog personas, and they're pretty bad. Stop yep. it, kids. Just like all personas. Just stop. <laughs> Now nah, live your life however you want. I'm not going to tell you how to do that. I hope that that is not as much a thing as it used to be. Um, uh, it has never gone away. It's a million. I know times it's not. It's I'm not, sure it's. I'm worse. sure it's not going away anytime soon. But as Sonic games become more and more atrocious, I hope less were, people will do that. They I think were that, always pretty bad. And I think that the, makes gen- it, the original Genesis games were pretty good. They're okay. One, two, I think that three. makes it more yeah. appealing though, because it feels like more of like a cult thing, you know? Yeah. Like it, it's like I'm part of a private secret society. <laughs> yeah, Sonic fan club. Yeah collect uh what are those things called chows yeah those yeah, and chaos chow, emeralds chaos. <laughs> yeah get all the chaos emeralds kids <laughs> kids do not collect chaos emeralds no, they are very dangerous if you see a chem- chaos emerald on the ground do do not touch it no call an adult no nah, you want to pick it up get seven of those you have to find rings. you have to find the uh the chaos gauntlet though if you, if you want to wield their true power that's, ask your that's parents different, that's mm. total, i think that's sure. the same thing it's not ask your parents or an adult does a dragon at least come if you get all before yeah. trying okay. chaos <laughs> that's what i was thinking i'm so sorry you get so all sorry. seven and shenron joseph <laughs> uh anyway let's we uh I are, think we've, yeah are we ready to move on to rex yeah yeah kenny wisdom would you like to start us off with the recommendations sure as soon as i can find it I can go. Yep, do that. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, I wanted to feel prepared, so I got it on my phone, and then you forgot there's and like you a bunch of apps it. open on my phone. <laughs> You've been playing Candy Crush this whole time. Kaylee, <laughs> what did you bring for us? Okay, so I am pitching Like a Daisy, which is a webcomic produced by uh, Tracy J. Butler, and it is the the long and troubled events surrounding uh, a speakeasy in Prohibition era St. Louis. Um, It's ran by cats who are adorable. Um, The founder gets murdered and his widow is like trying to keep the bar going and keep it afloat. There's a lot of uh, like it's a crime comic. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of like fighting with rival gangs, um, setting barns on fire, feeding people to pigs, uh, things like that. But it's done in a way where even the characters who are supposed to be, like, maniacal are kind of silly. Mm -hmm. Um, And I just really... The art is gorgeous. It looks, like, straight out of Disney. Um, They're just really adorable. It reminds me of that movie Cats Can't Dance, which is a great movie if nobody's seen it. Um, And it's just really cute. And there are two volumes i guess collected it kind of updates on an irregular basis but there are two volumes worth of comics currently available to read it's a web comic like a daisy dot com or like a daisy comic dot com i can't remember which one it is now but it's all available for you to read nice it is very adorable tell me uh so i am bringing once again Street Angel by Jim Rugg and Brian Maruka. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you're not familiar with my earlier pitches, this is a great six-issue black and white series. It's published by Slave Labor Graphics. And it is about a homeless teenage skateboarding superhero named Street Angel. Uh, she has no superpowers, although she does have awesome karate skills. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she fights supervillains and ninjas and Satan. And it's funny and it's a lot of fun and she teams up with a black exploitation character named aphrodisiac Mm -hmm. to fight a supercomputer from the 70s who's this just like old crappy giant supercomputer nice uh yeah and it's just it's fun and amusing and occasionally a little bit serious 
and there's a lot of great humor in it. And I love it a lot. So this is the first volume. There, there is, is no second volume. More comics after this. Nope. Is that just reprints of the reprints first? in color now? Yep, or? they okay. reprinted it, uh, but it is the same series. Okay. Because I knew the singles started coming out. I yeah, like, oh, I think I, this? I'm not even sure if they're in color. I think they might have just reprinted it. Oh, okay. Well, I thought they were in color. But it's a, it, they, they might be. I, I have it in trade. I also have it in single issues, which is something I almost never do. Mm-hmm. I actually bought the trade twice, and then I bought the single issues afterwards because I was like, I got to have these. Nice. Because they've actually got the like alternate covers on the back. Mm. They're really cool. Sweet. And I wanted them. Sweet. Because I love this comic. Kenny, what did you, uh, uh, what did you bring? I was going to recommend Sentences, The Life of M.F. Grimm yeah. by Percy Carey and Ronald Wimberly, mm-hmm. which is basically a, an autobiographical graphic novel about this rapper named M.F. Grimm, who I believe the book starts from when he was a kid. It's like in mm-hmm. the, the 70s all the way up through him, you know, starting to rap, becoming like getting pretty big in the rap world, uh, getting paralyzed after an assassination attempt, being sentenced to life in prison. It's just a really interesting... Um, Really interesting biographical work that I think it's maybe not as much press as it deserves, mm-hmm. just because it's kind of you know it's it's like a celebrity comic. It's like by yeah. a rapper, and like I, I don't remember who put it out off the top. Of, I Vertigo actually put it out in yeah. tw- tw- two thousand seven. Yeah, um, and I really like it. I, I think I enjoy it. I think even if you don't like rap or don't like uh, the kind of thing, it's just it's very much like we we're talking about with this book. It's just kind of a look at a different kind of life, and yeah. um, if you do like rap, it makes it that much better. Also black and white. Yeah, also also in black and white. And Ron Wimberly, amazing, I love amazing. Ron Wimberly. I've been Absolutely. trying to get his book Prince of Cats on the show. <laughs> yeah, like crazy. I think yeah. I pitched it three or four times. Yeah, he's a fantastic artist, and I really love this one as well. And it's just one volume. It's yeah, just one. And, one. Done. and what's the title of that again? Sentences. Uh, Sentences: The Life of M. F. Grimm. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. Chard, what do you got? Uh, kind of in the same vein, I am going to bring another kind of historical music comic. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm a huge hip-hop fan, and uh, it's one of the things that Kenny and I always like to talk about. Is what Free Pizza No Babies 2016. That's our rap I'm album. Gonna make, I'm going to make to do it. <laughs> it's our rap album, Free Pizza No Babies. Um, <clears throat> it's never happening. <laughs> Uh, but I'm recommending Hip Hop Family Tree by Ed Piscor, uh, printed by Fantagraphics, a uh, local comics company, Fantagraphics. And uh, this, is, this is a recap of it. It says, a young Pittsburgh bard travels back to the New York birth of rap with DJ Cool Herc and rattles off encyclopedic knowledge through dynamic, interwoven narratives of the 70s and early 80s. Um, it's backed by appropriate era art on pages yellowed with nostalgia and it's really cool. I, I'm a huge fan of this. There are now three volumes of this out. And so it is volume one is 1970s to 1981. Volume two is 1981 to 1983 and volume three is 1983 to 1984. They're all oversized in that they have like very large pages, but they're all pretty thin, like regular sized, um, trade paperbacks and as far as page count goes so i'm recommending all three um they're both really quick reads and they're super fun and if you love the early era of hip-hop uh they're great to check out and if you don't know any of it then they're super informative and you'll learn a lot nice edutainment that's what we're that's the buzzword Mm -hmm. we're using right now Right. Yes, that's what the editor said. You Hashtag three two one contact. You yeah. didn't pass this by the coach, but I guess we can talk about it. I mean, that's what came down from corporate edutainment. <laughs> we Push talked it, about it. <laughs> make it happen. And I was like, I don't know if I can get that by Kenny, and they're like, well, fuck him. <laughs> <laughs> this is a real, actual conversation. Mm, don't think it from is. corporate. Yep, totally real, hundred percent. Have the emails mostly because there's no chart. If you just make an account that says corporate, yeah. and email yourself. That's it real. It's hundred percent real. A corporation. I'm, go, I'm gonna go on you from the gutters.com right now and make corporate and a real email address. I'm just gonna email chart and no one else at view from and the gutters. tell him to fuck people. <laughs> Subject: yeah. Fire Joe. <laughs> Every body, week. nothing. <laughs> Every week we try. It doesn't work. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Kaylee, what do you want to read this week? Um. I think I'm gonna go with your pitch, which I Hip-hop. did not catch the name of. Hip hop family tree. Okay. Uh, I, I'm gonna vote for Kenny's pitch. Sentences. Yeah. Yep. Kenny, what are you gonna vote for? Uh, I'd like to read sentences. The life. You can't. You, <laughs> that's yours. You can't. Those are the rules. You cannot vote for your own. 
I'd like to vote for uh, Hip Hop Family Tree as well. Swag. And right. uh, I'm going to vote for that cute webcomic with cats. Lackadaisy. Because I'm all about it. How about cats? So it's a crime. You have to explain this more because I had questions. It's a prohibition like, era. I was like, like I'm going to vote for it anyway, comic, so it doesn't really matter. comic with cats. <laughs> right, but yeah. they're like anthropomorphic yes. people? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes, they yeah, wear clothes and drive cars. Too. So a little bit. And shoot guns. It's, it's so like, like Disney, Disney-ish? Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. All right. Yeah, it's, it's very Disney-ish. But, the, but not like the Aristocats. No, no. Like, like, like cats the, can't dance. Yes. Okay, cool. They wear suits and stuff? Yep. Like yeah, Donald the, Duck kind of like anthropomorphic well, wearing wear clothes. Pants and we have problems no, they wear with pants. that. Well, that's, that's, <laughs> they a, actually... that's a Donald, that, or that is a duck-specific issue. We have a real problem so... with that. Cats <laughs> wear pants. Yeah. Ducks do uh, not. All right. Bears don't wear pants either. Some of them I mean, the do. poo, you look Sometimes drunk. So. Did you guys? Well, that reminds me, on. I need to show you a comic ab- about a bear after we're done. Okay. Have you guys ever watched Franklin? The bear? Probably not. No, it's a turtle. Probably not because it's for children. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, oh, Paddington is the bear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. You so I just want There's you guys, a lot of bears. In Franklin, he's just a kid turtle. Nothing special about him. Right. Except for he's the only animal in the forest with a name. All the other animals just card like bear or rabbit. And he's Franklin, <laughs> and I just—it's just something that's really bothered me ever since I was a young adult because he's not some kind of royalty. He does, he, he's not like a local hero. No, if Franklin is not a title that you earn in battle. See, it's now, I'm just, now I'm just picturing you <clears throat> as you are now, sitting on the couch with like a drink in your hand, watching Franklin. Like you're there. Like you're into it. You're there. Like you've got like your Franklin hat on, <laughs> and you're like. This is Damn it! This, this show—it's like it's so unrealistic. Like, get it together. Do you think he made the other animals call him Franklin? They're like, "Hey, turtle!" He's like, "Call me Franklin." <laughs> That's the, I can only imagine. I can only imagine there's some sort of extortion happening. Well, all right, you can call me Fra- I'll call you fucking Bear. That's your goddamn name. <laughs> Do you think that's the side story of Franklin? I've, dark- I haven't heard a better explanation. VH1 behind the Franklin, the darker side of Franklin's drug habit. I don't know. And a schizophrenia. We'll find out <laughs> next time on View from the Gut. We won't. Uh, we'll thanks for that. listening, everybody. We'll uh, catch you next time. And thanks for being here, Kenny. Yeah. Who's a hoot. Yeah. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you for listening to View from the Gutters. I hope our recommendations have inspired you to go out and find some new comics you'll enjoy. Join us next time for a discussion of our selected title. But like every week, we encourage you to read all of the recommended books. In the meantime, please leave us an iTunes review. It really does help new listeners find the show. You can also like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube, and follow us on Twitter at ViewFRTHGutters. Feel free to email us at contact at ViewFromTheGutters.com. Please send us any questions, comments, or recommendations you might have. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel as we post new videos every week. And thanks again for listening. And as always, keep reading.